Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about Project Blitz. I talked about this a little bit at the rally today. Who's heard of Project Blitz? Okay, so about half the room. Great. So Project Blitz is a Christian nationalist state campaign. And I'm going to be talking more about what it is and how we, you know, what, what are the components of Project Blitz and how we are working against it to oppose it in states across the country, right? So I should mention we're going to be talking about a number of different types of bills that compose Project Blitz. And a lot of the bills we're seeing in states are not exactly aligned with these bills, but they accomplish similar uh, means, maybe through different language, but they're aligned, they're aligned in goals. So when I say Project Blitz-related bills, we're not just talking about bills that are exactly the same language. We're talking about bills that are aligned ideologically and, and effect-wise. And sometimes people get confused by that. So I just want to make that clear as we go forward. All right, so what is Project Blitz? It is a um, Christian nationalist, um, hold on a second. It's a concerted multi-issue state legislative campaign by Christian nationalist groups based on and justified around a concept of, a distorted concept of religious freedom. Um, so they use this idea to sort of justify these bills. And the, it's been compared to ALEC for Christian nationalist movement. Who's heard of ALEC? Okay, so most people. ALEC is a uh, campaign that basically promulgates legislation from one state to another state. It's mostly from businesses and it pursues sort of conservative interests in businesses. So this is, is an equivalent coming from the Christian nationalist movement. So it focuses on Christian nationalist bills. And um, it's also a really sophisticated campaign. So this is something that's been under development for years. They refine it every year and put out new policy guides and new information. Um, and they've gotten very successful in pushing forward these bills. Um, it was discovered and really made a, brought to awareness by a lot of people this past year, I guess 2018, by the writings of Fred, Fred Clarkson. Uh, from Political Research Associates and others who really brought Project Blitz to right light and highlighted it in the media. So since that time, it's been in the media a lot more and people have become more aware of it. The, the goals of Project Blitz are manifold. It really has three different phases. And um, basically the goals are to promote a false history that America is a Christian nation. They really try to promote this idea that America was founded as a Christian nation, it remains a Christian nation, and those groups like us that don't, don't believe that are trying to drag it away from its Christian nation roots. So it's this sort of false historical uh, narrative that these are trying to convey. Uh, they're also pr promoting a false vision of religious liberty, where only one set of religious values is enshrined to the law. So religious liberty means they get to practice, you know, conservative religious values and nobody else gets religious freedom. <laughs> That's the idea of religious liberty, which is really the opposite of religious liberty, if you think about it, of course. But that's the idea. When they say religious liberty, that's what they mean. Um, it also promotes an incremental range of state policies focused on really three main areas. Undermining the separation of religion and government, uh, undermining LGBT equality, and also attacking reproductive access. So those are the three main areas Project Blitz focuses on. So it's a multi-issue campaign. It doesn't just do one of these issues. It attacks them all in different ways. And actually, this is one of the ways we first learned about Project Blitz because you know, we were seeing all these bills across the nation that didn't seem linked together, like things I'm putting in God We Trust in schools and bills attacking um, LGBT equality and foster care and adoption. And, can, you know, those don't seem to be connected by any logical method. However, they're all promoted by Project Blitz. And once we started to understand that and was brought to light, we realized that basically this is a campaign where they're promoting all these things together. So we're able to work against it in a more concerted way. Um, the idea, and they say this pretty explicitly, is to flood state legislatures with all these bad bills in order to overwhelm and tire the opposition, which is us, overwhelm and tire us so we cannot effectively oppose them. They, David Barton, does anyone know who David Barton is? Yeah, a few people. He's a, I guess, a revisionist historian, Christian nationalist, who really promotes a lot of these issues. He said, it's kind of like whack-a-mole for the other side. It'll drive them crazy that they have to divide their resources out in opposing Project Blitz. So this is explicitly what they're trying to do, is make us uh, focus on too many states at once and uh, you know, basically focus on all these different types of bills. 
And it's also being used as a wedge issue against Democrats um, in some ways. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So one thing that we see when it comes to Project Blitz quite frequently is something we're calling faith baiting, where basically they, um, they try to, when lawmakers stand up against Project Blitz, and many of them have been Democrats, when they stand up against Project Blitz and stand up, for example, against an Ngawi trust bill in the schools, they have been often sort of dragged through the mud by the, by the you know, uh, right-wing media, by Fox News, by Breitbart. And this happened in Minnesota to Senator John Marty, who's a state senator in Minnesota. There was an In God We Trust bill in schools introduced in Minnesota, and he stood up um, on the floor of the Senate and spoke out against it. And at that point, he was attacked on Fox News. You can see here that the, um, the slides on Breitbart, on um, I think that's the Daily Caller, and different places for being against faith, uh, criticizing faith. But Senator Marty is actually a deeply religious man. Uh, he, he explained to me he is the son of a minister, the grandson of a minister, the father of a minister, and the brother of a minister. <laughs> so his entire family is very religious. And they're using this thing, faith baiting, basically to attack people who come out against it as though they were anti-religious when they come out against these bills. There's been some incidents where people speak out against some of these bills and they just start taping them so that they can use them against uh, the lawmakers in their re-election campaign. So this is definitely a strategy that we're seeing by the, both the Project Blitz proponents and you use in electoral politics as well. So who's behind Project Blitz? Well, there's three main organizations that are writing the, um, the, the model policies that we're seeing and really promoting it. But this is just the center of more like a constellation of different groups because they write the model policies and they sort of promote Project Blitz and create the prayer caucuses, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. However, the local groups on the ground do the actual advocacy. So they promote these model bills and then let's say, I don't know, the Center for Arizona Poli uh, Policy, which is a conservative uh, right-wing group in Arizona, would be promoting this on the ground in Arizona, for example. And that really does vary by state. So it's not just these three groups that are sort of behind Project Blitz. They push forward the policies and work with state and national groups in different ways um, in order to move them forward. Okay, so what is Christian nationalism? Well, it's not just, uh, it's kind of hard to read actually, it's supposed to be bolded. It's not just a very conservative interpretation of Christianity. It's, it has several components to it. It's a political ide ideology that posits a Christian right to rule, a uh, revisionist history that founders were devout Christians that never intended to create a secular republic. They believe that separation of religion and government is false and ahistorical. And that rejection of secular society, um, I'm sorry, rejection of secular society and restoration of an imagined Christian nation. So it generally promotes religious supremacy insofar as equality of other values, including other versions of Christianity, are not respected. Um, so, you know, we often, sometimes we get accused of using nationalism as like a slur, but it actually means something in this context. We're talking about Christian nationalism as an ideology. It's not, we're not labeling someone as nationalism. This is, a, this is a distinct ideology from standard Christianity or even conservative Christianity. I think that's important to understand. It's also, um, it's not the same as dominionism, but they are linked. Dominionism is uh, a philosophy that insists that Christians are called by God to exercise dominion over every aspect of society. So it's not quite the same, but they are, are linked in some ways. So the effect of having this Christian national, national narrative, Christian nation narrative, and this has been researched by Professor Whitehead um, from, uh, I think it's Clemson University, has done a lot of research in this area, has found that people that believe the major tenets of Christian nationalism are much more likely to vote for religiously conservative politicians, they hold stronger anti-Muslim sentiment, are less likely to support the separation of religion and government, uh, and for example, the Johnson Amendment, and are less likely to support LGBT equality and gender equality. So there's a lot of research done on this and the effect having these, these um, beliefs, uh, effect, how it affects people's political ideology as well. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing this promoted by Project Blitz, because if they can affect young people in the schools 
if they can affect the culture, then that will sort of shift this narrative and uh, change people's political ideology over time. So it really does matter what people believe is a foundational matter uh, about how the country was formed and what its purpose is and whether or not it was formed as a Christian nation. It has a real effect on what people believe and how they vote. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the components of Project Blitz, and there are two primary components. There are the prayer caucuses in many states, and then there are, is, I'll talk about the policy guide in a moment. So currently there are about 33 states that have prayer caucuses, and these are basically established within the state legislature. They're informal groups that are established within the state legislature. It could be on the House side, the Senate side, or both that are composed of lawmakers um, who come together as part of this prayer caucus. Now, not all of them know that project, that the prayer caucus is associated with Project Blitz. That's why they call it a prayer caucus. They're trying to seem innocuous to draw, draw people in that might be interested more generally in like religion, right? It's like your general average run of the mill, maybe a religious uh, Republican or Democrat might be drawn into a prayer caucus, not knowing this is actually uh, a part of Project Blitz, right? And so these are used to sort of um, get more widespread support. They often try to draw in Democrats, for example, and then use them to push forward some of the negative bills that we're seeing. Some of these prayer caucuses have staff that help them promote the bills that we're seeing, and others don't, and their affiliation really does change. But I should note that they're increasing rapidly. Last year, I think there were 28 prayer caucuses. This year, there are 33. And you know, there might even be more by now. It's hard, it's hard to know, we don't, can't keep like, an up-to-date count on how many prayer caucuses there are. But their goal is to have them in every state and use them as a vehicle to move forward with the negative legislation that we're seeing across the country. Um, they say that there are over 1,000 elected leaders that are currently members of prayer caucuses which is incredible if you think about it in different states across the country. Okay, so the second component is the Project Blitz Policy Guide, you see here. They just updated this for 2018 and 2019, so it came out towards the end of last year. And this is what they used to sort of promote the Project Blitz related bills. There's about 21 different model bills in here. It's, it's over 100 pages, I think it's like 130 pages. And so it includes not just the bills themselves, but places where the bills have been passed previously, um, media around the bills and what sort of reception they get, strategy and tactics for how to move it forward, talking points about how to advocate for the bills, and even responses to common, uh, our common talking points. So they know, they anticipate, oh, well our opposition's gonna make this argument about the bill. They're gonna say, you know, it's not necessary and it's a waste of time, and this is how you respond to that. So it's a very sophisticated campaign that they're already anticipating our reaction and working to move forward with their own messaging around Project Blitz. There's also, in addition to this, uh, these, the, these bills, there's also common things that they also see in state legislatures. For example, there's talking points against you know, the bills on conversion therapy, so they can oppose those as well and encourage conversion therapy. So there, there's not only is it these issues specifically on the bills, but they're also promoting more broad talking points to help push back on a variety of different issues that they're ideologically in, in agreement on. Uh, this was sent when it was published to hundreds of lawmakers across the country in different states. So they sent it out as broadly as possible to all their lists so that they all are aware of these model bills and can easily pick them up and drop them into their states, which is the main goal, right? To promulgate as, as many states as possible so that we can't stop it in every, everywhere. Um, Let's see. They also provide a network of technical assistance. So if you are a local group or lawmakers in a particular place, you're able to reach out to them and get technical assistance and help. Um, you know, how do we adapt this to laws in Alabama, for example? How do we, you know, who should I add to my coalition to make this move forward? So, they, it's, um, so it's not just the bills, bills themselves. There's also a model of support around moving this forward, and that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Let me give you some examples of what the Project Blitz related bills are. There's really three main phases. Um, category one bills focus on religious heritage. Category two are ending uh, resolutions about religious history and freedom. And category three are what they're calling religious liberty protection, which is really just the opposite. 
But the way that this project is intended is to introduce uh, basically low-hanging fruit bills, bills that are easy to pass in particular places so that they can gather momentum with their prayer caucuses, have experience winning bills, working together with lawmakers, generating success, and then introducing more challenging bills that they're going to face more opposition towards over time. So it's a multi-phase sort of project. And the ones we're seeing at the sort of the beginning phase that are most common are the bills about um, having In God We Trust on the wall, classroom wall of every school, in public schools, giant In God We Trust posters, and also teaching the Bible as an elective class in school. So it's not just allowing them to teach the Bible as an elective class, it's forcing schools to offer an elective class that is about the Bible. Right. So it's, it's still optional for the students, it's not optional for the school, which, must mean, which means they have to devote teaching resources, you know, classroom resources, they have to hire someone who's able to actually teach this, which is very, very little training for people, so it's often performed very badly in, in unconstitutional ways. And three, you know, they have to devote like, classroom space where it could be used elsewhere. So they're actually detracting from other educational resources to offer being forced to offer Bible classes. So those are just some examples in category one, and those were, we're seeing the most change. But there's other, um, you know, the category three are the ones I think that gets the most attention. Uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts. Um, the bill's about basically allowing for discrimination in foster care and adoption. There's those that have gotten the most attention, I think, at the federal level, at the national level. Um, and when they happen in states, but all these bills are linked conceptually from one tier to another. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. In 2018, we saw about 70 to 75 Project Blitz related bills in 27 states, you can see here. So it was quite a broad campaign across the country. Of this, about 10 bills passed. So 10 out of about 70, one in seven. So um, I should say, as someone who works in state legislation quite a lot, that's a very high passage rate. Right? Most bills that get introduced, 90%, 95% of state bills that get introduced in states, do not pass. So having a 10% pass rate like that, uh, higher than that, it's one in seven, um, is very, very, very high, which is what most concerned us about Project Blitz last year when we first became aware of it, because these bills were passing so rapidly with so little opposition, which is why we became organized and really started fighting back against Project Blitz, which I'll talk about in a moment. But you can see um, they're just all over the country, even in states you wouldn't expect. The bills that passed last year, there were six that focused on placing In God We Trust posters on classrooms and schools, and three that allowed for discrimination in foster care and adoption. Um, you know, and those are mostly portrayed as being against LGBT people, but they actually affect atheists and religious minorities as well, right? I mean, if they can deny based on their religion, they can deny certainly to atheists, unmarried people. Um, uh, this happened in, in South Carolina recently, was a Catholic woman who's denied, right? So it does definitely happen to people of different religions as well. Uh, there were a few other laws, but those were the most of them. Um, and some of these bills I should mention last year, they were introduced by Democrats or passed unanimously in some states. Like for example, the bill to put In God We Trust posters up in Florida in schools was both introduced by a Democrat and passed unanimously without opposition, unanimously. And this was linked to, can anybody guess? The school shootings. It was linked to the school shootings. As if a poster on a wall that says In God We Trust could stop school shootings. Uh, and so since, instead of doing something real to help the schools, this is what they did. And that's the, probably the most disturbing thing. So the effect on Project, project Blitz for seeing is pretty remarkable. If you look at this map of uh, In God We Trust bills from 2017 to 2018, when the project really started to ramp up, um, the number of bills increased dramatically. We saw more than 25 of these bills introduced in 2018 as compared to like three in 2017. And um, there's this interesting story about, uh, one of the issues is, um, as I mentioned, these bills are often being pushed for without any sort of opposition. And my favorite story about them is there's this bill last year in Louisiana 
that would have allowed teachers to basically pray with students as long as the students got waivers. So as long as the students got a waiver from a parent, the teacher could basically pray with the students. Now there's a lot of other constitutional issues with that, and we certainly would have challenged it in court. But, you know, we were unable to basically make any headway in stopping it. It passed through the House of Louisiana unanimously. Not a single vote against this, this bill, which is pretty clearly unconstitutional. Um, and, you know, uh, we advocates, not just us, the ACLU, Americans United, many other groups were working against this bill, were not able to get any traction at all until a group of sort of conservative organizations stepped forward and said, you can't pass this bill because if you do, uh, it's so unconstitutional that, um, you know, Amer Americans United and American Atheists and others will sue you and they'll just get a bunch of money and we don't really want that. So please don't pass this bill. And they actually listened to the conservative, <laughs> the conservative organizations and they watered it down so it doesn't actually do anything. Um, yeah, which is great. Go conservative organizations. <laughs> but um, that was last year. And since then, I think we've made a lot of headway on stopping Project Blitz related bills and also brought a lot of awareness towards them. This is what the bills looked like last year. The majority of the bills we saw were in God We Trust bills in schools, although the uh, bills to expand teacher and uh, student and teacher religious expression, there were several of those, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, Bible classes, um, First Amendment Defense Acts, and several others in schools. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about our efforts to oppose Project Blitz. And I'll start off by talking about what's happened this year. So the latest policy guide, the one that was posted at the end of last year, really focused on three separate areas. One was In God We Trust license plates. So they had had a lot of success in schools, but they wanted to pass laws allowing them to make specialty license plates um, all across the country that say In God We Trust. Um, and, you know, we've actually dealt with a lot with that because this, during research, a lot of advocates in Arizona identified that the money from In God We Trust license plates in Arizona was actually going to support the conservative legal group ADF, um, Alliance Defending Freedom. Everyone heard of ADF? Yeah, they're the group that sponsored at the Supreme Court. They're the one group that helped fight the Masterpiece Cake, case, Cake Shop case, and the Hobby Lobby case. So they're a right-wing legal group, and they were getting funded directly through these specialty license plates directly by Arizona. They earned over a, a, a million dollars that way over several years. So we think this, I, this, this whole plan was to have states sort of subsidize these conservative groups uh, using these In God We Trust plates. Fortunately, we have not seen actually many bills around that this year. Also, there was um, some resolutions they suggested about favoring heterosexual married sexual relations and about the religious speech in public schools, which I spoke about a moment ago. Although they suggested these, they really didn't, we didn't really see most of those um, being the focus this year. I'll talk about what the focus this was in a moment, but um, it shows you they don't have perfect control or a good sense about what the states are actually gonna move forward with, uh, even, they, even with these well-laid plans. Uh, regardless of their success last year, they did not have nearly as much success this year because we were prepared. Uh, after learning of Project Blitz, we, uh, our activism, and not, I don't mean um, American atheists, I do, I do mean us, but other groups as well really work together to oppose Project Blitz. Well, there were about 75 bills introduced this year in about 28 states around the country. Some had more than others. Texas, I'm looking at you. Uh, I think has about 15 or so bills <laughs> compared to most others. So quite a few in Texas, and that legislat legislative uh, session is still going on, unfortunately. Um, this year, we saw a slight decrease in the number of In God We Trust um, bills in schools, and a, a, a big decrease in Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, but the biggest increase was in Bible classes in schools. We saw about twice the number of bills about mandatory or encouraging Bible classes in schools uh, for students. And actually this um, sort of bloomed or exploded after President Trump came out on television advocating for Bible classes in schools. So I really think that made a difference, um, unfortunately, this year. And I'm, I'm thinking we'll probably see a lot more of these next year as well. Fortunately, we are starting to draw towards the end of the state legislative session. 
So we probably won't see these numbers change much this year, but we will continue to see Project Blitz, of course, it's not going anywhere. We're going to continue to see it next year as well. Oops. So this year, the bills that did pass were much fewer than last year, I think thanks in large part to the efforts and opposition to this. We saw only two In God We Trust bills pass this year, as opposed to last year, which were six. So that's a third as many, uh, which is an incredible level of success, right? So we saw them pass in only South Dakota and Kentucky. That's it, so far, which is amazing. Because they were really, like I said, passing without any opposition at all last year. Just 100% unanimous support. And now with the increased level of awareness, they're, they're not passing at all. Even in states where really would have thought they would have passed, like Nebraska, for example, that was one of the first ones that came up this year. The, the local um, secular Democrats, uh, we worked with them and several other groups organized against it, and they really effectively shut down the bill. It was amazing and very effective, and we're still receiving that replicated in other states around the country. So um, congratulations, secular Democrats of Nevada, um, Nebraska, thank you. Uh, but overall, things have been really, really good in that front. We're seeing a few Bible class bills pass, but the ones we're seeing move forward have all been discretionary. So basically they say, school districts, you're allowed to have a Bible class in your schools for students and elective Bible class for students. Um, but currently, that actually is the state of the law already. Schools can already do that. It doesn't need to be written in a law. They're already allowed to do that. So although it's bad and we're not encouraging states to pass those, I mean, we're fighting against them, it's a lot better than one that says school districts must offer these classes, right? Much better. Um, because in that case, there's a lot of places where they don't have the resources to offer it or they don't know how to offer it in a constitutionally appropriate way where they actually don't uh, promote religion. Because if they offer these classes, the Supreme Court has said, you know, you're allowed to have Bible classes in schools that focus on secular aspects of the Bible. You can study it as literature or as history. You cannot study it, or the history of the Bible. You can't study it as a religious doctrine. And it's been very, very clear from the Supreme Court. So when they offer these types of classes, they have to be very careful or they set themselves up for liability. And um, yeah, so, so we've basically seen, although they've been pushing forward more of these bills, they really have not been passing, which is fantastic at least this year. Um, there are a few other bills still in the works, but those are the majority of the bills passed this year. So overall, you know, it's been a lot more effective in slowing down Project Blitz. So what changed? Well, one was about raising awareness among advocates, lawmakers, and the public. Before we knew about Project Blitz, it was hard to link together these disparate types of bills and areas. But because now we all know about it, we're able to raise, it's in the media, Advocates know about it. The opposition knows about it. Lawmakers know about it. They're able to more effectively understand where these bills are coming from, so it doesn't just seem like, oh, why not just put an In God We Trust poster up in the school? Who cares, right? It seems it's clearly linked to this broader campaign that has a nefarious purpose, this deceptive purpose of adding um, you know, more anti-LGBT equality later on or undermining church-state separation. We also collaboratively developed a large array of new resources, advocacy resources, and better messaging. Last year, there really was no messaging around these In God We Trust bills and how to stop them. Now we have a whole website, which I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, to oppose these bills. So we have talking points, we have sample social media, we have action alerts, these have been distributed to all the partner organizations, so we're much better prepared to fight back against these types of bills uh, and, and all the different types we're seeing with Project Blitz. We're also working across coalitions in an effective movement, which is incredibly important. This is not a single issue campaign by the opposition. It affects LGBT equality, true state separation, reproductive access in other areas. So we have to fight it in a way that's not just us, but we're working collaboratively with other groups as well. Um, it's the only way to be effective. So we've formed those coalitions and groups and we're working better across these affected movements. And we also have more active opposition in state legislatures and through grassroots engagement, which I really want to thank all of you for, for all the letters you sign when you see my action alerts and you actually take action. We really very much appreciate that because it makes all the difference. And people that have been willing to go testify, uh, like in Nebraska and other states against these bills, um, with actually hearing people op oppose them in hearings, that makes a huge difference. Or even just being in the room and wearing you know, um, an atheist t-shirt makes a huge difference in opposing these. So um, I think that has really made, you know, been very effective in uh, stopping Project Blitz and really pushing back against these bills. 
The most important thing, I think, is awareness, however. I mentioned earlier lawmakers may not be aware of Project Blitz when they join a prayer caucus. You know, they might not know it's linked to Project Blitz. But as this week gains an awareness um, and becomes higher profile, it makes it harder for them to become associated with the prayer caucuses and not know about the bills and not know where they're coming from or the larger agenda. So that's been critical. And if we can raise awareness amongst lawmakers, we can also, um, you know, show, give them tools so if they do come under attack for the faith baiting I was talking about, they have talking points, resources, ways to oppose the bills in ways that are not, cannot be portrayed as anti-religious um, so that they don't get attacked by their, you know, and used as harmful for their constituencies. So that's, that's important to the lawmakers so they can oppose the bill um, in, in those different ways. And uh, there's actually a way here at this conference you can raise awareness about Project Blitz. So we set up an action center over by the American Atheist store in the exposition room where we have several computers for action alerts set up. So if you have not yet already done it, or even if you have, you can go just sign on to the action center and send an email to your state lawmakers that links them to the blitzwatch.org site, which is a campaign site we set up to fight Project Blitz. So it has all sorts of different resources. Uh, it has talking points. It has messaging. It actually has a bill tracker, too. So you can, you can go into Project Blitz and see all the Project Blitz-related legislation, where it is, how far it's progressed, uh, where, you know, has, is it killed, is it about to go to hearing. You can see everything about it. And if you click on those, you can even see the bill sponsors, the language of the bills. Everything is all in one place for your convenience including talking points. And we did this with several different organizations. There's a coalition page, if you, um, if you look around the site, which shows you many of the organizations that have signed on to this effort. And like I mentioned, they include not only just church-state separation groups, uh, groups like Freedom from Religion Foundation, um, but also groups like PFLAG, which of course focuses on LGBT equality, um, the Interfaith Alliance, uh, which is you know, a more liberal uh, religious group, um, groups focused on uh, reproductive access and justice. So lots of different groups are working together on this campaign. And they've been providing us with talking points because we might not be the experts on every area of Project Blitz, but by coordinating with the groups that are the experts, they're able to provide us with language so we can provide better messaging that works for everyone in the coalition. And we find that's been really effective. So we have sort of unified messaging that any organization at the national or local groups can take up and use to oppose these bills when they come, when they come into their areas. So please check it out, blitzwatch.org. And if you get a minute, please stop by the Action Center and you can send it right to your, it's very easy, it's like two clicks. You just sign in and send it right to your lawmakers so they can become aware of it as well. So although Project Blitz has been um, difficult to work with and challenging, it's also been, um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to sort of turn it around and, and use it to our advantage. This is a concerted multi-issue campaign so it requires us to fight it in a way that we work together. It requires us to build bridges with other movements. We really have to work with the LGBT movement. We have to work with the reproductive access movement um, and others in order to fight this because otherwise we just won't be effective as we saw last year when we were opposing the In God We Trust bills in schools and nobody else was because they didn't know it was related, right? We were not effective. But now that we've built these bridges at the national level and in many places at the local level, we are much more effective in fighting against this legislation. So, and just, you know, building those sorts of bridges is not just pay dividends now to fight this legislation. It's much more helpful in the future for local organizing, for working together for a variety of conferences or working towards positive legislation, right? So it's, it's, I think it's an opportunity for us to, because they can see how all these issues relate. So it provides a clear roadmap what the opposition's, um, opposition's goals are so we can relate them together. It's also, Project Boyce is clearly an out-of-state special interest promoting extremist bills. So we should label them. We should use that against them. If we see these bills come up, we know who's promoting it. We have their playbook. We literally know it's being promoted by out-of-state interests who have this sort of extremist Christian nationalist agenda. And if we can point to that from lawmakers, um, it may turn some of them off of, this, you know, off of these bills, even though they might seem innocuous to them at first. If we can show it's part of a larger agenda, it might help them understand that this is a negative bill. And it also allows us the opportunity to promote a more positive, um, historically accurate uh, 
a vision of what religious equality and, and religious liberty is. It does talk about church-state separation and why it's important in a way and link it back to these issues. And one thing we did is create a, um, a model resolution or proclamation. It's on, available on the website about religious freedom that you can use to get introduced for Religious Freedom Day, which is in January, which talks about the importance of the separation of religion and government, talks about the historical basis of religious freedom and why uh, it's essential for everybody, um, people of faith and, and atheists and secular people. So it's, it's a really fantastic resource. And if you're looking for something to do around Religious, religious Freedom Day, uh, it would be fantastic if you can take this proclamation, introduce it locally in your towns or municipalities and get it passed. It's fairly straightforward and I'm very happy if you need any assistance in sort of reconfiguring it for your area. But it's, it's a fairly straightforward process to get a proclamation or resolution done and it helps promote the ideas that we are for real religious freedom, not this fake version being promoted by Project Blitz and we're for real religious equality. And that is it. I don't know if I have any time for, thank you. I don't know if I have any time for questions. Thank you. We've got about six minutes, so we do have time for Q&A. Please raise we your hand. We have a few so minutes for questions? OK, great, great. See your hand back here. Uh, my question is two part. First, is there a way we can view um, which politicians received this um, Project Blitz package from the Prayer Caucus? Um, I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Is there a way we can um, determine what, like, which politicians received the package from Project Blitz so we can? No, there is not. Now, some prayer caucuses are fairly open, like they'll post their names on websites and their state, so you can look for a prayer caucus in your state. Um, there is also the prayer caucus website, so if you go there, sometimes they're linked to different prayer caucuses in different states. Um, and if they, they're on a prayer caucus, then yes, they've been sent the, 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 the um, materials. But other than that, there's really no way for us to know, um, unfortunately. Is it possible for us to apply, obtain that playbook so we can see what bills are part of Absolutely, their? it's possible, yes. I think, we, I think it's broadly available. Um, I believe we put it on our Blitzwatch website, but if it's not there, I can send it to you. So I, I th actually, I'd like to make sure it's actually on our Project Blitzwatch website. Um, but regardless, yes, it is absolutely available. I can give it to anybody who wants it. Thank you. Hey, wait for the microphone, please, because we're recording. One of the categories of bills passed by these folks was religious refusal. Yes. Would you explain what that is? Sure. So religious refusals more broadly are basically um, giving people of different stripes, usually professionals, the ability to refuse to perform, perform services for people based on their religious beliefs. Like for example, I want to explain it because people might have the question too. Um, like for example, in Texas, there's a bill for counselors, right, which would allow them to refuse to provide their services um, to atheists or LGBT people or, or others, anyone they dis religiously disagree with based on their religious beliefs. So it sort of shields them from professional ethics laws, right? It sort of shields them from non-discrimination laws where it says you can't discriminate against people or laws about even medical best practices and not being negligent. It sort of is a shield against a lot of different areas. So that's a religious refusal. And we see it in lots of different areas. It can affect, it's often applied to a reproductive access, things like you know, even accessing contraception at like a pharmacy or like uh, getting an abortion in a hospital. So all those different areas it can be applied to, but it's also applied more broadly. There's a bill right now in Texas called SB 17, we're watching very closely, which would apply to religious refusal law, which would allow you to, uh, anyone who has licensed by the state, the state licenses, I don't know, hundreds of different jobs. It licenses tow truck operators, right? It licenses uh, lots of different things. But anyone who is licensed by the state in, in Texas, if this passes, would be able to refuse to offer services based on their religious beliefs. Uh, and it's not restricted to one area, it's, it's all, any religious belief. So it's, it's very, very broad and dangerous. Absolutely. Do we have their mission statement? I'm sorry? Do we have Project Bliss mission statement? Yeah, it's on their website. I don't have it right in front of me, I'm sorry. Yes. 
well, one second, one second, let me get you the, the uh, I haven't heard you mention anything about the anti-vaxxing movement. Uh, the anti... Vac vaccination. Anti-fascination? Vaccination. Oh, vaccination. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Which is based in religion. Yes, it is. And, Absolutely it and is. And even, uh, even very liberal states like my home of Vermont yeah. has not gone in the correct way. And uh, I'm wondering what you're doing about that is a great question, that. and I should be clear, this is not all of our state work. American Atheist works much more broadly on state work than just Project Blitz. We do a lot of positive work in states, like for example, we are working very closely with Unchained at Last on ending child marriage bills, right? So I'm just talking about a segment of our work about Project Blitz. Uh, bills about vaccination are one of the major things we contributed to and worked on this year, uh, bills stopping these religious exceptions in vaccination. Uh, for example, there were good bill bills proposed in places like Washington State, in Maine, um, and I think Connecticut and several other places, which we contributed testimony for and did action words around and really did a lot of advocacy, you know, to end these religious exceptions in vaccination. So it is absolutely something we work on, that in other areas, but is not part of Project Blitz. Like it's not in the Project Blitz book. It's a separate sort of issue. So that's why I haven't really focused on it. So our work is broader. Uh, we work both on a lot of positive bills as well, like like ending conversion therapy, for example, because that's also a religious issue, right? That's why people promote it. Uh, but we also, you know, focus on a lot of negative bills. Many of them are part of Project Blitz, but not all of them are part of Project Blitz. All right, we have one last question in the back here. Oh, I'm with the, the uh, In God We Trust in schools. Um, have any teacher unions been approached about this issue? I was, would think teachers, many would be absolutely furious and devastated to have to teach in a classroom. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. No, it's a difficult issue to, to challenge legally uh, because there's been some significant precedent that says, ridiculously enough, in God we trust is not a religious statement. It's not a religious. So, of course, that's absurd, but that's how some courts have ruled, that in God we trust is not religious, uh, which makes it more difficult for us to challenge legally. Now, if... Uh, and we think it's different even more so in a school because students and teachers are forced to be there. So it's more of a coercive environment, right? Because teach, students, teachers must be there all day, all day long. They have no control over this, this poster in their own classroom that they must look at all day long. And students, you know, they don't have, they're under 18, they have to be there as well. And so we think it's a course environment. The challenge, and a lot of teachers are against it. We get lots of emails about this, people raising complaints when these bills pass in their, in, their, in their states and they're being forced to put them up in their schools. Um, teachers are concerned that if they bring forward challenges, they're going to be fired. We get that all the time. So, and I, I think it's a valid, very, very valid concern. But until we get, start getting students, I mean, teachers and students that come to us that are willing to sort of stand up and say, you know, I'm going to risk being fired. Uh, I want to go to court over this. It's going to be challenging for us to fight this in court. But yes, there are definitely teachers that are opposed to it. Um, sometimes unions and schools, you know, uh, speak out against it. But they're worried about backlash in their communities as well. So I think we need to do more work as a movement, uh, us and the other groups working on this, organizing and uniting with the teachers' unions and with schools and um, superintendents' associations, et cetera to be able to allow, give them the confidence they need to speak out against these bills. Um, and I think that's what we have to do long term in order to fight back against this. Because like I said, Project Blitz is not going away. We're gonna see more of this next year. And although we had success this year, we're gonna, they're gonna come back with new strategies. And I think we have to do the same. Thank you. Great, thank you.